Good morning, good afternoon, good evening all. Uh, very warm welcome to the BIPSA education webinar series. Uh, we have Michael Witter from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. You know, as all of you know that this webinar series is based on a book endorsed by IBIPSA some time back. Uh, we are in 13th session. Michael Wetter would be talking about a view on future building systems modeling and simulations. We'll have his session for next 45, 50 minutes or probably a little more. Uh, and then we'll take a question and answers. I request Michael to start a webinar. Welcome, Michael. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to present a view on the future of building system modeling and simulation that's oriented based on the book chapter and also has some uh, recent extensions uh, added. So I've started with the trends and vision that uh, drive some of the motivation and some of the predictions I'm going to make afterwards in, throughout the talk. And first of all, I'm going to stress out that design and operation of a building and discrete energy system becomes uh, more multi-physics, dynamic, and also inherently more complex. So what's shown here in the graphic is a, a schematics of a, a discrete energy system where individual energy hubs that are clusters of uh, buildings, whether it's commercial or residential buildings, are integrated with each other in a way that they can share waste heat and waste cooling through a heating grid. Then these energy hubs are also integrated with the electrical grid and with the gas grid and overlay to that will be a control system that allows them to do a demand shifting among these different energy carriers. And ultimately the vision of those type of systems is that the individual buildings can beat uh, excess heating and cooling into a market as well as storage capacity to uh, help the uh, integration of the increased amount of renewable energy. Another view of the problem is also uh, from the point of increased electrification. And because of the increased electrification caused by a higher amount of renewables on the grid. Uh, there are some new challenges on the modeling tools. So in the first part, uh, in terms of the temperature level, it's certainly decreasing. If you compare that, the temperature level is about 30 to 40 years ago, where we uh, primarily burned fossil fuels to heat buildings. At that point, uh, temperatures were relatively high. And that had the advantage that it decouples control loops between the generation and the consumption. But it also incurs uh, energy as well as exergy losses because of those uh, temperature differences. And now moving toward vapor compression cycle, uh, those temperature differences need to be reduced in order to increase the second law efficiency. And that inherently couples uh, control loops between generation and uh, distribution and consumption much more tightly. So it causes uh, new challenges from the control point of view, in one side because of these temperature loops, but also because of storage capacity, which in the past was not that big of a driver when we had uh, relatively uh, lightweight buildings with little thermal mass, and now we see more uh, thermal energy storage uh, in installed, for example, on the graphic, you see a chilled water plant with a storage a tank that's multiple uh, stories high. Other technologies that allow energy storage are, for example, ground coupled heat exchanger or phase change material that's embedded in building construction or batteries, whether they are stationary or part of electrical vehicle. And those storage in buildings allow us to do load shifting in order to increase the amount of renewable that can be integrated into the grid, but it also requires operational planning and therefore new ways of how we control buildings and district energy systems. So if you are looking at today's uh, control related problems from a survey that uh, a bit more than 10 years ago, uh, this survey basically pointed out that the most frequent uh, control-related problems are due to programming errors. And that's a bit uh, uh, 
disconcerting here because those systems are typically simple clock-based uh, controller where you have a time schedule and then proportional and integral loop that tracks that point. And if you are looking now at the trend of new building systems, we see that those control systems become increasingly complex, so moving toward modulative control for large buildings and at some point toward modulative control for buildings and communities. So suddenly the control system become more grid and energy aware, which increases the complexity. Yet we don't even manage to uh, operate today's buildings, especially today's commercial buildings, uh, satisfactorily. Another view of the problem is the degradation of equipment performance, which is uh, well known that uh, after installation and also after commissioning, uh, the equipment keeps the equipment performance keeps degrading. And here is really the question is how can we uh, test control sequences in design, implement them error-free, and then run models in the sense of a digital twin in real time to detect and diagnose faults as well as a degradation in equipment performance. Basically, how do we use the model to uh, guide the design, automatically deploy those sequences, and then have a, a digital representation of the building running in real time to monitor the building and to operate it uh, better. So that brings me to the uh, point of the requirements that uh, we are facing on building simulation and auto district energy simulation uh, programs. And from a high level point of view, we basically want to schematically define any building, HVAC and control system uh, to be simulated, optimized, analyzed, and also operated. And if we are looking at what that, those uh, sentence actually means, is from a uh, upstream point of view in terms of the uh, input from digital planning process, we have various uh, data sources, whether it's the building information model, an electronic manufacturer catalog or schematic editor, as well as special purpose uh, graphical user interface, and in the future probably even autonomous modeling based on artificial intelligence that uh, should uh, define the schematics of such building systems automatically. On the application side, on one side we want to do simulation as we do today, but increasingly there's a need for optimization as well as integration with core compliance tools and the visualization tool and better support for operation, which includes, for example, export of uh, conventional control sequences, reuse of model or modulative control, or hardware in the loop testing if you are looking at new uh, equipment or new system solutions that ultimately should be deployed to buildings. What that now means from the requirement on such uh, behavioral models and solvers, where behavioral models is a term that they use to express models that describe the physics as well as the dynamics of buildings. On one side, because we want to be able to define any building and HVAC system, we basically need uh, user extensible component and system libraries, preferably in a standardized format so that we can exchange them across different tools and across different users. And we want to apply that to buildings, which means we need to uh, be able to solve partial differential equations for heat and moisture transfer, as well as ray tracing for daylighting, and typically make use of parallel coding in order to reduce computing time. And if you're looking at the HVAC and control system, what's uh, needed here is really symbolic and numerical routine so that we can solve what's called a hybrid diff bar system of differential algebraic equation, where continuous time dynamics from the physics of HVAC equipment is coupled to a discrete time dynamics from a, a time sample control system, as well as to a state event that may arise for example, from a thermostat that switches when a temperature crosses a certain threshold. So these are mathematically very difficult problems that, in my view, really require a fresh look at how we design and implement the building simulation code. So the positive side here is that we are not really the only community that does such type of system simulation. And what's shown here is the evolution of the state of the art in the system engineering community. 
where in the 70s and 80s the focus was primarily on simulation. So there was a lot of activity in development of the differential equation solver and auto solver for algebraic equation. In the 90s and around 2000, the focus shifted more toward modeling, for example, support of differential algebraic equation. Uh, uh, different ordinary differential equations are coupled to algebraic constraints. And that required then also uh, the introduction of new modeling language and associated compiler technology then that can automatically translate models to executable code. What we are seeing right now is increased focus on tool integration based on standardized interfaces like the functional mockup interface that we see later on, as well as model-based system engineering processes. For example, uh, design V where you are moving from uh, electronic representation or digital representation to hardware in the loop testing and an automatic construction of devices through digital manufacturing. And we may predict that in 2020, 2030 time frame, the focus is more on autonomous modeling, where modeling may become a commodity that's really accessible through web-based services, for example, and supported then from the back end with artificial intelligence so that you can specify at a very high level what kind of design requirements you have, what your constraints are, and the models can be automatically generated and optimized to satisfy those requirements. So the shift is certainly more and more towards how can we automate the modeling process and also automate then the system level optimization. To realize such autonomous modeling, uh, it's important to look at system representation. And to quote the uh, American linguist uh, Benjamin Watt, uh, he said, language has shaped the way we think and determined what we can think about. And similar statements also apply to modeling, uh, where a language really determines very much of what you can do afterwards with a model in terms of what kind of physics and dynamic you can simulate, how you can analyze the behavior of the model, and how you can use that model in downstream applications, for example, for real-time control or for mapping a model to a, a proprietary product hardline of different control vendors. So the modeling language plays an increasing role, and by language, I'm not so much concerned about syntax, but rather about the structure of what kind of mathematical properties can be expressed with a modeling language. And if you are looking at how today's billing simulation programs are written, they are typically in procedural languages. You have a class, for example, a C++ class that has some data and some procedures where a procedure is being called and this procedure manipulates the data and returns some, some data as a result of the computation. But that's completely disconnected of how you would typically formulate a physical equation or even a control sequence. On the other hand, an equation-based modeling, uh, that's basically uh, structured in such a way that you have a device that's typically oriented based on a physical encapsulation. This device uh, exposes interface variables, that's so-called POTS, and then a modeler can implement equations that define how those POT variables are linked to each other. And looking at that from the point of view from a very simple heater where water flows through and you can add a heat input in order to heat that water, a uh, modeler would typically write down a differential equation, as you see on the lower left side of the, the chart, and then implement that uh, within a, a computer software. And on the right hand side, you see such an implementation in terms of signal flow diagram. And having access now to those equations allows then to determine, for example, that the mass flow at the outlet of the equipment changes instantaneously if the inlet mass flow rate changes and also if the inlet mass flow rate changes. The pressure at the outlet is going to change in instantaneously, whereas the outlet temperature is not changing immediately. It only changes as time evolves through this differential equation. 
And such type of information can be used then to devise a very efficient uh, computing routine to analyze real uh, input output dependencies of such variables. But having looked at that, we really have to ask ourselves uh, why do we impose such a causality? If you are looking at uh, the equation themselves, all that basically specified is a differential equation with initial condition and some algebraic constraints. Once we implement that in a simulation model using some sickle flow diagram as shown on the right hand side, we impose artificially some causality. But that's really not needed. It's only an artifact that we do because in the past it was needed to implement such models in a computer because computers typically always have causal assignments so they process inputs to produce new outputs. But such a, imposing such a causality is First of all, quite inconvenient from a modeling point of view, and it also limits the, the reuse of models. And that's shown in this uh, chart here, where we have on the top uh, two implementation of a simple problem, and a problem that uh, contains uh, heat conduction. So if you see in the middle graph, if you are familiar with the symbol, you see that there's a boundary condition that's uh, connected to a sine wave. And as a convection element, the heat conduction, and there are two thermal mass separated by heat conduction. And on the right side, there is a temperature sensor on the feedback control loop. So looking at this schematic model, it's quite clear of what's being implemented. Whereas if we are imposing this input-output causality, we have to use a signal flow diagram, as is shown on the left side in this uh, blue uh, signal flow diagram. Uh, obviously, the signal flow diagram doesn't really allow us to understand what kind of physical process is being modeled here. And more importantly, if you want to make a change to the system architecture, uh, change is uh, quite easy on the schematic modeling. All that's basically needed if you want to inject the heat, not at the mass one, but at the surface of the conductor two, is to delete one line and draw a new line. So it's a process of about one to two seconds. Whereas on a, a signal flow diagram, you basically have to recreate a signal because you have to add new uh, blocks, as shown in green here. And some block, uh, one block has to be removed, as shown in the red color. And you have to reconnect quite a few lines. So basically, you have to start almost from scratch again to implement a new model just because of that small change. So this uh, convenience here in terms of those languages really raises the question now, how can we build models like we built, for example, uh, a house with Lego? And the analogy is such that in, if you look at Lego, you basically start with some substrate. Someone is making building blocks. And then you come with some blueprints that you want to realize. And you eventually build a, a house. Similar with equation-based languages, the substrate is essentially the differential equation or algebraic equation that the model builder would implement, encapsulate that in icons, and then you would graphically connect those icons together to form a system model. And that's in quite a con stark contrast to today's approach where we typically write C or C++ or Boston code that is not really transparent and it has very level, low level of reusability. The key advantage of those uh, modeling approaches is really what's called uh, separation of concern. So from my point of view, we should clearly separate the modeling from the actual computation. So in modeling, we specify a system in terms of uh, graphical modeling. And then these graphical blocks contain a causal equation. They can uh, contain algorithmic code, for example, for control sequences. Or they can call out the uh, pre-compiled code like C functions if you want to link in, for example, a ray tracing software or a computation fluid dynamic tool. And then based on this model representation, you generate code. So for example, code can be generated for time domain simulation or for real-time operation. And once you generate code for real-time operation, you may take the same uh, representation but you take into account the uh, limitations on memory or predictability of computing time. So you 
may link it up with different numerical solver to satisfy those constraints. Or you can generate code for optimization where gradient information may be produced. Or you can generate code for core simulation or to exchange them in a standardized format that we're going to uh, touch up and later in the talk. The key principle here of this new approach is really the separation between modeling and computation. Because computation models can be automatically generated and we should really try to focus on expressing models in a way on which we can do analysis and get uh, more usage out of the models to support new analysis process as well as uh, the construction process and the operation of the building. So there are some standardization that helps in that regard. And let me explain a bit of from my point of view where we are in terms of standardization in the buildings industry or the building simulation community. And just suppose for a moment we develop the building simulation program. But each with a mutually com incompatible model format, different semantics, and incompatible software architecture. And that would give rise to an uh, ecosystem like we have right now, for example, where we have Trace, Consum, Equest, Energy Plus, LIDAR Eyes, Transys, Virtual Environment. So there's a whole set of different tools that are really incompatible with each other. And users are typically not very satisfied because of lack of functionality of those tools that really to a very large degree uh, replicate the features that are already available in another tool. And about 20 years ago, there was a brilliant recognition, uh, largely by Pierre Salin, that models can be developed once, stored in a repository, and then exported to simulator. So Pierre Salin introduced the uh, is a model language called Neutral Model Format, from which uh, you could export models in Transys, in Spark, and uh, for Transys, for Spark, and for HX in Plus. And this Neutral Model Format is uh, still in use now as the uh, language to express model in the ida ice software. Unfortunately, that effort was probably a bit ahead of its time, and then it was stopped by ASHRAE TC 4.7. So I think that opportunity that we had at that point to have a common language for the building industry really was stopped because of some of the defunding that happened within uh, ASHRAE community. So next, there was basically uh, in absence of being able to share a model, people start looking at the core simulation. So various core simulation interfaces have been developed each with a different application programming interface and different, if any, formal semantics. For example, Energy Plus was linked to Contem, Trentis was linked to Champs, ESPR was linked to Trentis, and they each had different interfaces. And uh, about 10, 15 years ago, we developed the building control virtual testbed that tried to standardize such an interface and link it, use the same interface for a variety of tools. And it looked at that point as a nice idea, but it was very difficult to realize. And also it lacks uh, some standard and rigor until some tools, tools started using uh, another standard that was a bit more formal for doing code simulation called this functional mockup interface standard that I'm going to introduce shortly. So those uh, fragmentation in terms of modeling languages and also co-simulation gave rise to two standards, primarily outside of the building industry. But the people from the building industry were early uh, part of those uh, standard committees. One standard is uh, Modelica, which is an open standard for, of uh, equation-based object-oriented modeling language that allows to uh, express models graphically as well as in an causal or algorithmic code and then there are tools available that translate those models typically to C code, link them up to solver, and uh, form an executable. And that uh, effort started in 1996, and today, for example, 7% of the German power production is optimized based on open source Modelica tools. So it's an industrial strength language that has various applications in uh, energy systems, automotive systems, aerospace application as well as 
increasingly in building. For the code simulation, the automotive industry uh, faced a similar challenge than we face in the building industry, that there was a variety of tools that needed to be coupled to each other because they were had uh, uh, individual application domains that uh, they cover. And there was really no standard available to couple those tools. So uh, Daimler Chrysler started uh, a relatively large project to standardize how uh, simulation software exposes its application programming interface so that it can be seamlessly coupled with other tools and models can be shared among those tools. This FMI standard is now supported by more than 100 tools and uh, the implementation, for example, in Energy Plus, in building control virtual testbed, in transit, and also EDF is using it for smart grid co-simulation. The nice part of this standard is that now we have a clear application programming interface and people can develop in interfaces in simulation tools or that can work on master algorithms that integrate multiple simulation tools and they can work across each other so you are not really locked into one particular coupling, but rather you have an ecosystem of different approaches that can basically be developed in parallel and then the most suited one can be used for the particular application. So let me explain a bit of what some of the principle of this uh, modular equation-based modeling. So on Modelica is basically structured in such a way that uh, models are exposing what's called a connector. And in connectors, uh, basically va physical variables are exposed that uniquely define the physics at that uh, interface of that device. For example, for heat flow rate, you would expose temperature and heat flow rate. These connectors are stored in a library so that people are, or different models are using the same connector. And they are used then when you implement, for example, a model of the heat capacitor, where you instantiate these connectors, you may add parameters, so that are values that do not change with time. And you can also introduce variables like the temperature of these elements. And then in an equation section, you can formulate the algebraic equation and differential equation. This model is then encapsulated graphically in an icon, and when you uh, someone is using that model, uh, that person would typically drag that from a library, uh, also drag other models, for example, for a uh, radiative heat exchange, and instantiate the multiple of those models and draw a connection line between these connectors. And in the background, by drawing such a connection line, a tool will automatically uh, generate such a connect statement. And because the connector says that temperature is a usual variable, a tool can automatically uh, write the uh, equation that equates this temperature. And because the heat flow rate has a flow prefix, it knows that that's a conserved quantity, so it can automatically set up conservation law. And the same machinery applies also for electrical system or for fluid flow systems or for translational systems. So it's a formal way that makes it very easy then to graphically assemble system models and embed information so that the tool can automatically uh, analyze the, the connection between those systems and generate uh, eventually simulation code. Using such a connection mechanism allows us then to schematically model complex systems. So what's shown here is uh, a small heating system where we have on the lower left side uh, an Ocasal schematic diagram where we connect, for example, a bylaw with a pump and a flow resistance. Above it is algorithmic code for a controller. You can do block diagram modeling using uh, the signal flow chart that we saw, be saw before, which are very well suited for control uh, sequences. You can have blocks for state events. For example, this switch basically outputs true or false whenever the input, which is the theater room air temperature, crosses the, the threshold. On the top right, we have a spatially discretized partial differential equation for a room model. 
connected to uh, ordinary differential equation for radiator and an algebraic equation for flow friction in that uh, flow lag. And on the right hand side, we have a stage graph that switches, for example, the pump on based on the temperature of the storage tank, and then afterwards, the furnace is switched on, and if the tank is charged, first the furnace switches off, and 10 seconds later, the pumps also switch off. So this uh, mechanism allows us now to graphically assemble these various models together, which makes the, those different modeling formulas quite accessible to end users who may not have a detailed knowledge of how to implement the state graph, but they can graphically assemble it and link it up to other parts of the system model that define, for example, the air conditioning system or the filling envelope. So using this uh, modeling approach, uh, various uh, libraries have been developed for building applications, and they are listed on this slide. And about six years ago, uh, a few of those developers came together and said, let's not uh, also have the same fragmentation now in the building industry if we use the, all the same language, but let's get together and develop the joint core library, which has been the called the Annex Ixia library and is now renamed to the Avitsa library. And this uh, Modelica library basically provides a core for air conditioning system and also some control systems and mathematical functions. And they are used now in four libraries developed by Aachen, by Universität Künze in Berlin, by uh, LBNL and by KU Leuven. And our hope is certainly that other tools will eventually also join and use that core of the library so that we can jointly work on implementing uh, the core of a library and then customize it in order to satisfy the needs of the end users that differ among those different tool developers. Another question is really how does uh, such a model translation really work? What are the key ingredients to make such graphical modeling uh, uh, that do not specify input-output connectivity. How, does, how do we, what are the methods that make those approaches work? And that brings me to a second, uh, second part of the presentation where we talk about some of the algorithms of translation and simulation. And typically a translation process of those graphical models are such that you have uh, distinct stages here where you start with an object-oriented model and from an endpoint user point of view, all that you are basically invoking is a simulation button or simulate function, but in the background there is a parser invoked that eliminates first the object orientation, then symbolic processors are invoked that do a index reduction for differential algebraic equation, and then apply two methods that we're going to touch up and later, the block lower triangulation and tiering. There's also uh, various other uh, mechanism are implemented here, for example, automatic differentiation to compute the Jacobian matrices that are needed to solve uh, nonlinear equations. And at the end, uh, code is being generated that typically C codes, and then the code is compiled and in order for the model to be in a form that can be simulated. So two of the key processes here are this uh, block lower triangulation and tiering. And from a very high level point of view, the block lower triangulation happens such that uh, it does a rearranging of the individual equation so that all the ind incidences are on what's called the lower part of this uh, diagonal matrix. So typically, those methods start with making this incidence matrix where the columns are the variables and the rows are the equations. And if you now color each uh, element gray, if there's a dependency between an equation and the variable, you get the pictures showing the middle of the graph. And if you were to manually solve this equation, you would certainly solve first the second equation for T1, then you solve the third equation for T2, and at the end you solve the first equation for Q. And that can be done by rearranging the equation, and that's exactly what's happened in this block lower triangulation, where those equations are being reformed in order 
for them to be solved explicitly. This process is completely automated in such tools. Another approach that also used in, those, in all of those tools is tiering. And suppose you have an equation uh, 0 equal to f of x that has multiple dimensions. And if you can rewrite, or if the tool can rewrite that form, equation in the form shows with uh, on the left hand side in the equation 1 and 2, then you can basically separately solve uh, these subsystems. So looking at a small example here on the right hand side, if you have these two equations, you would typically rewrite the first equation explicitly for x1, and then you can plug in x1 into the second equation, solve x2, and then iterate uh, until you, you satisfy a convergence criteria. So you typically be, uh, pick a guess value for x2, solve the first equation, substitute this solution in the second equation, which gives you a new value for x2, and you repeat the whole procedure until you converge. And by doing so, you basically reduce the number of equations that need to be solved simultaneously, and that has uh, big implications on the performance. Because a lot of those numerical methods, they scale cubic in the number of unknowns. For example, if you have an equation with uh, two times as many unknowns as another system, it typically takes about eight times longer to solve them. How such methods are applied on a real-world problem is shown here in the uh, application of a kinematic loop, where the problem itself uh, started with about 1,200 equations. In the first step, the tool eliminated some alias variables, so that are variables that are equal to each other and are typically formed by this connect statement. So then we still have about 330 uh, equations that are coupled to each other. And then invoking the block lower triangulation, they have been reduced to about 250 by 250. A dimension and applying tiering at the end reduce those equations to a nonlinear equation of dimension two and linear equation of dimension two and five. So here we basically went from a 330 by 330 system to a system that has dimension five. And that has huge implication then on the computing speed. And the whole process is really automated and uh, hidden from the end user. But that are some of the main steps that are implemented in these tools that make that technology work. So now the question is really in terms of uh, integration in tool chains of those methods. And we can say that for a scientist, typically a model needs to match observation. But from an engineering point of view, a model really needs to allow designing, constructing, and controlling an engineered system. So rather than looking at billing simulation just from the point of view that we need to have models that can be validated with an actual building, we should also think of how do we need to construct models so that they allow us to automatically construct building, upload uh, control sequences to a control system, and then control and monitor the, the building using models from the design process. And some related work that's ongoing in that area is uh, the project called Spawn of Energy Plus, where we are modularizing Energy Plus and uh, base it based on the Modelica and Functional Mockup Interface standard. So here the architecture is basically such that there will be uh, small changes to the Open Studio uh, application programming interface in order to minimize disruption for the end user. But then OpenStudio would instantiate the models from the Modelica Billings Library. Those models are sent to a translator, for which we are using the JModelica translator. And this JModelica tool does then the computer algebra and code generation, eventually exports the functional mockup unit so that the computing unit that is compliant with this SMI standard. We are also working on new numerical methods in our group here that, that are called quantized state system solver that are very promising for fast simulation of coupled uh, physical systems and control systems. 
then those systems are simulated with Pi FMI and the results are being fed back to Open Studio. So the end user would typically only work on the Open Studio layer, but underneath we have the software stack that allows them to simulate the billing system much more flexible and also actual control sequences. And once uh, this design is completed, uh, the intention is that uh, those control sequences can then automatically be implemented on billing control systems, either through machine-to-machine -machine translation, where we analyze then the structure of those Modelica models in a way that will allow us to map them to actual product hardware. Uh, product uh, lines of different control vendors, or alternatively, one could use this functional mockup unit and run it directly on a billing control system, as we showed with a proof of concept a few years ago for the Tritium Niagara system. So the main intention is really on that part. On one side, from the user point of view, to support uh, more flexible modeling, better uh, uh, interoperability with control workflow and product development and base everything based on open standards in a way that allows us to do to support the new use cases that target more and more the billing operation as well as the analysis of very innovative systems that may not yet be possible in today's architecture. So moving toward optimization, if you want to optimize those system in uh, operation, then we are encountering quite large-scale optimization problems. And here the question that I pose on such future environments for modeling and simulation and operation is how do we make use of those repository of models that are being developed and together with the repository of optimization algorithms that are typically developed by uh, numerical or no, applied uh, numerical people and combine them so that we can have frameworks for, for combining models and optimization and basically bridge the silos between the engineers who create models and the applied mathematicians who are strong on optimization methods. And there are a few examples of such frameworks in development and also available, like IDOS, JModelica, and OpenModelica. And how they typically work is shown on the next few slides, where we have an optimal control problem, where you basically minimize, for example, energy consumption, subject to constraints posed by ordinary differential equations. And the hard part here is that we try to optimize a function, basically the optimal control sequence, which renders the problem not solvable in general. So one way to solve those problems is to uh, transcribe them to a standardized standard optimization problem where we basically uh, convert this infinite dimensional optimization problem to a finite dimensional optimization problem using some sort of part points where we discretize the problem. A method to do that is the so-called uh, collocation method where the control function, which is unknown and shown here in uh, black, is approximated at certain support points by polynomials, shown by in the green color. And those polynomials have unknown coefficients. And the, to solve this optimization problem, rather than doing repetitive simulation to minimize the cost function, one can directly solve for those uh, coefficients of the polynomial coefficients that satisfy optimality constraints, constraints on the differential equation, and also constraints on uh, inequalities like uh, thermal comfort. And those methods typically scale quite well for large scale applications. We applied those methods uh, a few years ago on for a relatively small uh, modulative control for at the room level and compared those approach as implemented in JModelica with a conventional optimization methods also implemented in JModelica called NLME. And using those uh, symbolic processing uh, cut on computing time from about five hours to eight seconds. So they are very promising to be used in the billing industry. And we are also developing an open source software platform that uh, uses those methods in the background and should make the modulability control more accessible to end users and thereby allow 
uh, scaling of those methods to many more buildings. So it's not only addressing optimization or solving the optimization, optimal control problem, but also system identification and adaptive models to automatically train a model in order to reduce the engineering labor needed to install a motor predictive controller on a building. Uh, somewhat an extension to that uh, approach where one simply uses the collocation method to directly solve the nonlinear optimization problem has been done by KU Leuven. And here the interesting approach of how they leveraged the uh, modelic was that they have looked at the uh, the equation systems that are formed by the billing system and the HVAC system. And the billing envelope is typically uh, can be linearized with uh, very high accuracy. So there are mo mostly linear equations involved here, whereas the HVAC system is nonlinear. And the approach that Leuven uh, went here is to restructure the uh, billing envelope and HVAC model in such a way that they can be decoupled symbolically. So there are small changes done to the uh, Modelica model. And then they can be solved independently. Uh, you can solve the linear problem and the non-linear problem. And through that, you can basically generate very efficient code for solving this non-linear optimization problem by exploiting the linear part of the model. And again, that's really enabled here through this flexible modeling approach and through the uh, possibility to symbolically process those equations and linearize a model based on the original mathematical formulation. I think that really illustrates some of the flexibility that's provided then by those methods. Now, from the end, point, end user point of view, the formulation of the optimization problem is quite easy in the sense that you have extension, for example, to the Mod Modelica language that allows you to optimize, to formulate an optimization problem that extends, for example, a model called the electrical network. So there would be a full uh, simulation model where we can augment it, for example, with some keywords like initial guess. We can formulate constraints that need to be satisfied such as constraints on the room temperature, on the battery charge. And then we can specify whether we want to minimize energy or peak demand and over what time horizon. And by using this high level specification, we can quickly change, for example, the cost function as shown in this graphic that uh, shows the voltage in a community that has a large fraction of a renewable energy generation. And if you were to minimize the cost, you may violate, for example, constraints on grid stability. So once you add those constraints, you stay feasible and minimize costs, as shown in the green chart here. Or if you were to minimize for energy, uh, you would reduce distribution loss and somewhat obtain a different control sequence. So that's a very flexible approach now, how to formulate such optimization problem and really analyze the effects of different metrics on the stability of the electrical grid as well as on the economics of how to operate such systems or neighborhoods. So to close this presentation, I just quickly introduce a, a project that we launched under the umbrella of IBIPSA called Project One that really tries to collectively advance those technology for our community of uh, building system and district energy system. So project one is concerned about uh, how do we generate the simulation model out of a data model, whether it's a, a GIS system or the strict energy system or building information model at the building level. And then how do we generate simulation model? How do we create model libraries in Modelica that allow us to model such systems efficiently? And how do we conduct simulation analysis and also model predictive control using those models? So the tasks that are covered in this project one, are uh, the first task is concerned about developing libraries for design and operation and for modability control based on the Modelica language. And there's a task on building and city quarter model that's focusing on the mapping from data representation into simulation models. And there's also a task that's focusing 
focusing more on application dissemination of those technologies. And what we're also talking about now is developing something like a batch test, but for modability control, basically a standardized test suite so that we can compare uh, different approaches for modability control for building and communities so that we see which approaches are most promising, how much benefit or performance do we get out of different formulations, and also what the associated engineering costs needed to set up those tests. So similar than a validation of simulation software, we are striving here also a validation for the optimal operation of buildings. This project one is a continuation of a five-year project called Annex 60 that we uh, completed this uh, summer and fall. And we had a kickoff meeting of the ABIPSA project one in August. And we started now the research phase, and it's still possible to join if you're interested in contributing to the technology. You can visit the web link at the bottom of this slide, and also the final report of the Annex 60 that's about 500 pages long will be available in September and October, both as a free downloadable PDF format as well as a book. So, with that, I would like to open the presentation for discussion and questions. Do we have any questions? I request you to type it out in a question pane so that uh, Sayonkita can moderate it. Do we have questions? Do we have any questions so far? No? Sangeeta, does any question appear on question team? Hello, does uh, any question appear on question pane? Yeah, so I see a few questions here on the on the questions pane. Um, shall I probably ask them yeah, on either, behalf? Yeah. yeah, either you can uh, unmute the person who wants to ask question or you yourself can ask question on the person's behalf. Okay, so Surbi Joshi, uh, uh, she's asking, uh, she's saying this is great, how can we also use this approach to develop uh, building form finding algorithms? Yeah. So the building find forming algorithm, the way I understand it, is essentially how, uh, to f uh, find uh, different uh, building envelope architecture through generative design. And the uh, way that would work in such an approach would be that you would do an optimization for the building geometries, basically parameterize the building as you do today in various tools like this uh, grasshopper based uh, tool. And the uh, way where Modelica would come into the play then is how do you, in the translation of this building geometry to a simulation model. So this translation can be done to a conventional building simulation software or to a modelica based simulation software if these translators are being uh, implement, developed and implemented. However, because the building envelope is uh, usually quite structured, I don't think that's one of the strengths of the modelica approach so far. So I, for generative design, because the generation, the optimization really happens more on the data model of the building. The technology is not changing much whether you're going to use the modelic at the back end or whether you use the conventional building envelope simulation software at the back end. 
Okay. Uh, the second question is, uh, what are the criteria for uh, joining the project? Uh, you can find them online. There are three different member classes. So we have uh, 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 individual participants who don't make uh, upfront commitment in terms of how to much they contribute, but we do expect substantial contributions from them. Then there are also organizational partners who uh, commit uh, half a full-time employee over, uh, every year over the duration of five years, plus attending of the uh, expert meetings that we conduct every six months in person uh, for about two days, and also participation in web conferences that we conduct about uh, once a month in the individual tasks. And then there are also organizational of sponsoring participants who provide uh, a cash contribution of uh, $5,000 per year that then used to offset the meeting costs. So all the funding goes into uh, uh, support of a meeting and also some other organizational uh, costs. So it doesn't go directly to research, it's more in terms of uh, covering overhead to make it easier for people to participate and attend those meetings. And we do have two of those uh, sponsoring participants already, Ms. Mitsubishi Merl and Ms. NG Aksima. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Jesse uh, Henson. Uh, I apologize for my pronunciation. Um, are you working with manufacturers of uh, products? Yeah, we, we do have collaboration on and off with various manufacturers and also in Annex 60 and with Project 1, we have manufacturers part of the project team here. Also at LBL, we have been working with the manufacturers. And I think okay, uh, a lot of the control vendors, they are using Modelica now within some part of their organization to develop control sequences. And we are also aware of quite a few equipment vendors who are using Modelic as part of their product development process. Thanks. Um, next question is uh, from Devang. The idea of models becoming a free commodity can be wonderful for AI and machine learning. Um, is there any ongoing development uh, on these lines? Uh, well, on the lines of free models and free tools, there are there's certainly quite some activity. For example, all the, the libraries that you saw before, the Saibitsa li library as well as the Aachen Library, Leuven, UDK Berlin, and the LBL library, they're all free available at no cost. And for the simulation environment, there are free uh, simulation environments as well as commercial simulation environments available. There's not much done yet in terms of generative modeling or this, uh, model generation based on artificial intelligence, but I, I would uh, speculate that this one is a new line of research where we hopefully see more and more activities uh, moving forward as the, the simulation back and becomes stronger. And then the question is how do we build up, how do, does one build up uh, a, a business behind those? But if we are looking at the increased commoditization of simulation, I think we can make some prediction that those methods become easier and easier available and companies may offer other services uh, around those uh, simulation uh, uh, offerings that then allow, for example, to design a building based on a particular product that they may eventually sell to the building. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Paula Borges. Um, I'm not sure I understand the context because she's not uh, given the slide number. She's asking what's the challenges to apply this in large scale? And I'm going to try and unmute her so she can ask the question. Uh, Paula, I've unmuted you. Uh, could you please clarify what, you're, what you mean to ask?
Hello, Paula, are you there? She may not have a microphone with her. Probably we can go for next one. Okay. Um, so next question is from Francesco. Um, when are these developments going to be available for the normal energy energy modelers? So it's hard to say what you mean by normal energy model, but uh, a lot of a lot of the models that you saw today they are available already in quite a few years, and there are various groups that you saw on some of the slides that distribute the Modelica libraries. They are open source tools that uh, keep improve, uh, improving their performance. So we are working with some of those developers together. There are also commercial tools available that you can use for the simulation. And we know of a few design firms who start using now Modelica, often in consultation with uh, someone who is already trained in, in those methods. So I think the technology is available. It's a matter of getting trained in it and apply it then to specific problems. There's certainly other technology that is still in development, for example, scaling up those models to uh, larger buildings, that's still uh, research and development tasks that's ongoing, and also tighter integrating those uh, modeler modeling in other tool chains, like the Spawn of Energy Plus, that work that's still ongoing right now. But if you are using just a graphical environment, like with Dimola or or similar tools, they are available uh, on the market already. And also the libraries can be downloaded today. Um, thanks. And I think this is the last question here. Uh, Michael uh, Beguin, um, any case study or pilot project available for Ibipsa Project 1? So can you repeat the question again, please? Question is, uh, are there any case studies or pilot projects available for IBIPSA Project 1? Well, there are members of the IBIPSA project who conduct their case studies within that project and basically report on, on how they conduct the case studies. I'm not quite sure what's meant by whether case studies are available. But if you go to the Annex 60 webpage, there are various papers about Modelica for building a district energy system posted there that show different applications. And also, we are soon about to publish the final report that contains uh, a few hundred pages of different case studies that are done with Modelica and also with function mockup interface. Okay, um, I think that's it. Thank you, Michael. Uh, this was wonderful. And I think this is one of the uh, highest sort of uh, webinar, not many particip participants today. Uh, thank you for this. And thank you, Sayangita, for your support at the last moment. Thank you all. I just and wanted, we will join I just you. Wanted, I just wanted to let the attendees know that the recording uh, of this presentation will be available um, through the Ibipsa University, is that what it's called? Yes, we will check the recording and if it is found appropriate, we will upload it on YouTube channel of Ibipsa University. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Mike, yeah. again. Thank you very much for organizing it and for attending. Thank you. Bye.